Welcome to Evona Origin Stories, the space podcast where we bring you extraordinary leaders from within the sector as we explore their fascinating stories of early life, career, and how they broke into the space industry. This week on the podcast, we're joined by Sam Peterson, Director of Spacecraft Operations at Firefly Aerospace and former Swedish Space Corporation Business Development Director. With a military background, Sam's extensive industry experience has taken him on an incredible journey through the space sector. He's been involved in some enormous projects that we'll discuss later in more detail. In this episode, we dive into Sam's very unique space origin story and the path that led him to Firefly, an end-to-end space transportation company. By designing, manufacturing and operating reliable launch and spacecraft vehicles, Firefly are committed to enabling sustainable, affordable and convenient access to space for small payloads. Hi Sam, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you? Good, yes me too, very good thanks. I really appreciate you joining me at 7 o'clock in the morning on your end. (laughs) My pleasure. Oh, great. Well, it's our pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to speak to you today. Um, I've spoken to the team um, that you're familiar with. I know you've got some really interesting experience in the industry that I'm really looking forward to discussing with you. Well, thank you. So to begin, just to give the listeners a bit of an overview of you, why don't we start from the beginning? So tell us about the early days of Sam Peterson. So where you started in life, where you grew up, school, college, and how you then found your way into your early career. Okay, well, well, thank you. Yes. Uh, so I grew up uh, in Wisconsin. And um, I, th- I think uh, for Americans, they probably know where Wisconsin is. But uh, maybe since you have a very international audience, so Wisconsin is kind of in the middle of the US and very far north. It's in the, uh, you know, north of Chicago, if you know where Chicago is. And um, we get, uh, let's say, all four seasons quite distinctly in Wisconsin. So the <laughs> The summers are hot. The winters are very cold with a lot of snow, Um, but it's a nice place to grow up. Uh, It's it's very rural. There's a lot of farms. Uh, I live near uh, Lake Wisconsin, which is about a half hour outside of the capital Madison when I was growing up. And uh, yeah, it was a a great place to grow up. And and, and early in life, uh, I got a love for science fiction from, you know, I guess Star Wars and Star Trek were the, you know, the (laughs) things of my generation that kind of... uh, made people interested in space and I'm I was no no different than you know a lot of other kids my age I guess in that regard and yeah I mean I was just fascinated by space from an early age and uh I guess you know the real space side not the science fiction side one of the earliest memories I have is uh when I was in third grade is when uh, the Challenger disaster happened mm-hmm. and uh I remember very distinctly how they you know brought all of his kids into the room because you know the teacher was going to space and we all were watching in the classroom as you know as that that shuttle uh disaster happened you know and, and exploded live on television and it was very very shocking for i know i must have been about eight years old at the time um and yeah but uh then i, I guess you know fast forwarding a little bit from my childhood to you know how i got into the industry i i joined the army out of high school so i didn't go directly into college uh, I was 17 when I graduated high school and uh, I joined the army and in the army, that's where I learned satellite communications. Uh, so I got exposed to a lot of different aspects of, uh, I guess, geostationary satellites. Um, I, I worked in a, a tactical environment where we had like a satellite system that was inside of a van on the back of a Humvee and you would go drive out into the desert and set up the communications links for, you know, the, the deployed units. And I worked at a strategic site where it was, you know, a fixed SATCOM site. And it was like uh, what in the industry we would call a teleport where, you know, the communications links all come in and they're all going out to these, these tactical units and these Navy ships and things. Um, and then I was also a satellite controller. So uh, le- learned how to, you know, manage the bandwidth on the satellites and how to, uh, you know, bring, bring on multiple users and how the network is managed and, and things like this. And, and uh, I did seven years in the Army, so that's two, actually two tours, so it's a little over seven years, uh, but two four-year tours. 
And I didn't actually go to college really until I got out of the army. I mean, I took a couple of classes here and there, but I really started going to college after getting out of the army. And here in the U.S., we have something called the Montgomery GI Bill. It's one of your benefits you get for being in the army. And uh, that helped to pay for my college then. And I did that while I was... Uh, Actually, when I first got out, we moved back to Wisconsin. So I was newly married when I got out of the army and we just decided to move back where I had grown up because um, I met my wife uh, when I was stationed overseas and she was living in the U.S. for the first time at this point. So we moved back where my family was, where I grew up in Wisconsin, and there wasn't really any um, space related jobs uh, to be had in that area. It's, the industry is not really big in Wisconsin. And I also didn't have a degree. So it was, uh, you know, difficult even with my experience from the army to break into the industry, shall we say, or to do anything really related to the industry. So I, I managed a uh, an automotive store for a couple of years, uh, first getting started in in kind of sales, and then and then getting my own store to manage um, and learning how to, you know, do, do the whole, all the aspects. It was like running a small business, even though it was you know part of a chain and it was owned by somebody else. I managed my own location. But I eventually found my way into defense contracting work uh, because managing a tire store, I didn't really have that much time for school, which was kind of one of my goals. So uh, some of my friends from the Army had helped me to get my first defense contracting job at this point. And that's where I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. And um, I was working mostly night shift. And I was going to the University of Maryland, which was one of, I think, about three different choices that we had to go to college on base. So there wasn't a lot of options. Um, you know, you had to take what they had available at the uh, the education center on the base, but it uh, it was a way for me to get my degree. And also I was getting additional experience in the industry at this point. And uh, so we lived in Japan for, I guess, about three years. And, uh, uh, and then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I took another contract job in, in Germany. And we moved back uh, over to, to Germany where uh, my wife's mother was living at the time. So we lived close to her family then. And, uh, and then I finished uh, a couple of master's degrees while I was working for four years in that contract job. And that's kind of, I guess, I, you, you know, how I got into the industry initially, but then a big transition happened when um, I got an opportunity to work at the European Space Agency. And uh, it was really kind of a, a stroke of luck, I guess you might say, you know, a recruiter reached out to me from one of the companies that was there. And I had no idea this was even an option for me, <laughs> you know, and I remember he, I mean, LinkedIn was pretty new. This was probably 2011, 2010, somewhere around there that he contacted me. And uh, you know, he just reached out and said, hey, you know, your profile looks interesting. And I'm, I'm recruiting for this job for, for ground data systems at uh, you know, the, the European Space Agency. And if you're, you're interested, just contact me, please. And uh, I remember looking at that and I remember sitting down and I was having a coffee with my wife. And I said, this looks like a fascinating job. You know, I'm going to get to do all these cool things at ESA that they have here. But uh, you know, down at the bottom, they listed all these nationalities and, you know, American wasn't one of them. <laughs> so I, I immediately thought I wasn't even, you know, qualified to apply for the job. And maybe the guy had made a mistake and didn't understand that I was, you know, a U.S. citizen. And, uh, but, uh, you know, after talking it through over coffee, I said, you know what, what's the worst that can happen? You know, he can tell me that, you know, I'm the wrong nationality and then I'm no different than I am right now. But if I contact him, maybe just maybe it, it might work out. And, uh, so that's what I did. I, uh, sent in my resume via email. And if you could consider your email to be a, a, a cover letter, my cover letter said, uh, hey, thanks for reaching out. Uh, I've attached my resume as you requested. I'm American. They probably won't hire me, but thanks anyway. And uh, yeah, so all the things you read about how your cover letter has to say this, that, or the other, uh, I guess maybe that's not always true. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I ended up, I ended up uh, getting the opportunity of a lifetime to, to go and for eight years, then I worked at the longer than I was even in the army. I worked at the European Space Agency and I got to be exposed to a lot of different types of missions and, and, and worked with some really great people uh, doing some really amazing things. And that really kind of changed the course, I would say, of my career. That's what I would almost consider that to be my entry into what you would call the, you know, the space industry. Because I know I, I have a lot of friends from the military and they have good careers, you know, but they're, you know, they're, they're tangential to you know the kind of you know work that 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 you guys recruit for and in and, and the kind of work that i'm doing now um and i keep in touch with a lot of them but uh it's like a different part of the industry so it's like i i made a shift from one part of the industry to another at that time wow that is 
such you have such interesting experience that must as you said as a child this is such a common theme that we get of people in childhood loving star wars and star trek and kind of dreaming of space to go on then to join the army at such a young age and to then just it just sounds like it just snowballed living in japan living in germany having all this incredible experience couple of masters you dropped that in very casually very very impressive work and i really love kind of the story of how the, the ESA reached out to you on LinkedIn and you didn't think you were qualified. I think that's a really common theme. And I think a lot of people listening will be happy to hear that because it's such, it's so common for people to count themselves out before they've even applied and think, oh, here's X, Y, and Z reason like you, because you were American, you didn't think that you would fit the criteria. But I think this is a very good example of don't listen to the, the self-doubt. If, they, if someone is, especially in this case, someone had reached out for you, I think that it just really shows the importance of just saying yes to opportunities and don't, don't be the one to say no to yourself yeah absolutely i think uh you know they they, they have a a word for it you know they, they they call it imposter syndrome and i think a lot of us have that i, I know i have it you know like i think when i worked at isa i remember the first two years i kept thinking like they're going to figure out that i have no idea what i'm doing here <laughs> you know yeah. I, I mean you know i I mean, I did. I had the technical background and I was doing things that I was familiar with while I was also learning new mm -hmm. aspects of it. But I remember the whole first couple of years, I was just like, wow, I, do I really belong here? Do I, these people are so much different than me. And, 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 you know, it turned out that uh, I did belong there, but, but it, it took a lot of convincing, self-convincing on my part, you know, and I think a lot of people in our industry and a lot of people in general have this kind of, you know, self-doubt and, and, you just have to work through it. You know, you have to um, overcome that and, and, and say, Hey, I can, I can give this a try. You know, the, um, I think it was Richard Branson that said, you know, if somebody offers you a job and, and you don't feel like you're qualified for it, you know, take the job and learn how to do it. You know? And I think that's, that's a good uh, mentality to have in life. You know I mean? We're all, we're all born not knowing things, you know, and, and we learn as we go and, and just, just have that, you know, that, that, that passion to learn new things and to try to accomplish things. And really you can do anything. Yeah. That, what you just said reminded me of a study I read. I won't quote the statistics because I honestly don't remember them exactly, but it was, they did a survey of CEOs um, and they asked them kind of what their number one con concerns or worries were in, in themselves in their job. And the number one worry among CEOs was that people would realize that they had no idea what they were doing. Which, which, <laughs> which actually was very comforting. I thought when I read that because it's it just makes you realize it. It's all the way to the top, and it's it just kind of shows when you read stuff like that that it is when it's coming from yourself. It's usually baseless. It's you. You look at these CEOs and you think you know you've got it all together. You know what you're doing. But then when you when you when you ask them and when they're in in surveys like this, where everyone is deep down doubting themselves to a degree. But yeah, as you said. It's just about saying yes to opportunities and kind of learning on the job. And that's how you kind of grow the skills. And I think that's how you've maybe got to where you are now. It's very, some incredible experience. And it sounds like you just said yes. And it's eventually led you to where you are now working for Firefly Aerospace. Um, I think now would be a great time for you to kind of maybe just tell the listeners a bit about Firefly Aerospace, kind of what you guys do how you fit into the space sector and as well, where you see yourselves developing over the next five years. Well, yeah, thanks. You know, Firefly is really a fantastic company and it's uh, it's a, a completely new experience for me. I've only been here a few months now and coming from, you know, the military and ESA, and then I worked for the Swedish Space Corporation for, for a period as well. Um, you know, these are organizations that uh, have been around a long time and have a lot of uh, let's let's say good processes in place and and you know they're very set in in how they do things and coming to a startup like Firefly that that uh, has a completely different culture um, is is really a, a new learning experience that I'm having right now and and it's fantastic because you have uh, I mean this is the first time I think in my in my whole career where I'm coming in and the 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 teams that I'm I'm working with I'm like the old guy <laughs> you know the I, I remember just about every job I had even even up to um most recently Swedish Space Corporation when I came in most of the people I was working with were older than me um you know I was I was often the young guy on the team um and then we we did hire some younger people at, at uh, so we had a good mix at um at, at, at SSC after a bit 
Uh, but the the business development team was mostly maybe 10 years older than me when I when I first started. Um, but but here I'm coming in and 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 there's this, you know, this new generation, you know, full of great ideas and, and this this energy that they have to kind of, hey, let's just figure out how to do this, you know, and if, if uh, like, I, I go travel for a couple of weeks, and I come back, you know, and I've, and, and all of a sudden, they, they're doing something, they've gone a different direction now, you know, I mean, things move really fast, and it's, it's fantastic. And, and uh, so Firefly is, you know, first and foremost, we're a space transportation company. You know, so we had our successful alpha launch in October. I'm sure you you probably saw some some press about this, and 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 very exciting. You know, to to reach orbit, there aren't many. There's a lot of companies that have ideas for rockets and and trying to reach orbit, but there aren't many that have actually done it and 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 are you know on their way to repeating it. Uh, you know, on a, on a normal cadence, the way that we are, and uh, beyond just rocket launch. Um, we're also getting into the satellite business, which is you know why they brought me in. So uh, so I'm the um, director of operations for spacecraft and we have two spacecraft missions that are currently in development we have the space utility vehicle which is uh you know just like it sounds it it's designed to you know be like a space tug or a you know a, a way to get your you know your payload to various orbits or various places in space and whether it's doing plane changes in leo or taking it from a, a leo launch and raising the orbit you know, it can do a lot of different things. And we're going to have our, our first demonstration of that later this year. Uh, but then once you get a little bit further away from, you know, the, the, you know the, the planet Earth, we have the Blue Ghost mission that we're working on. And this is really exciting stuff because we're going to land on the moon the middle of next year, you know, and we're, we're on schedule. Um, you know, everything's all systems go and we're going to be, you know, ready to take this mission to, you know, our, our nearest neighborhood, uh, you know, our, our nearest neighbor in, in the solar system. Yeah. Middle of next year, we're taking 10 payloads to the lunar surface. So this will really, you know, with these first alpha, then SUV, then Blue Ghost, uh, Firefly as a company will really de demonstrate our vision of space transportation, everything from Leo to lunar and beyond, you know, and it's it's really exciting to be part of a company that's doing these groundbreaking things at, at such a fast pace, really. Yeah, absolutely. It must be so exciting what you guys are doing to be going to the 10 payloads to the moon. That's so, such exciting work. I've seen some of your guys' behind the scenes video. I've seen their engine testing videos and it's it just must be so exciting to be a part of. And I know especially as you guys are really focused on kind of um, with these kind of launch vehicles, in-space vehicles and the services that you're providing, there's a focus on kind of affordability, convenience, reliance and predictability really to an extent, isn't it? In kind of the products that you're providing and the services. I think that's really, really important. It's really exciting to kind of see the work that you guys are doing, especially that behind the scenes video. I really loved watching that and seeing the team. Everyone seems so engaged. As you, as you said, you mentioned the culture. You can really, you can really see that, I think, from the videos of everyone kind of working together. It looks like such an, a lovely environment to work in. I think everyone is clearly so, so excited for this kind of joint, this joint mission that you're all on. It's incredible to see. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and this is the first real kind of space transportation focused uh, company that I've, I've been a part of, you know, so I'm seeing new aspects of the industry that, that obviously happened on missions that I, that I've been involved with, but I'm seeing, you know, different, uh, you know, different part of the mission life cycle, I would say. So it's, it's really continuing to learn new things. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've been in the industry for God, I haven't, I've, I've lost count more than 25 years, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's a continual learning experience and, and it's fantastic, you know, to see, you know, Firefly is just a part of it. You know, the, the, the industry as a whole is, is doing things these last few years that, uh, that, you know, seemed impossible just a few years before, you know, you know, the, the way that, uh, you know, rockets are, are coming back down and, and being retrieved now, and, and they're not just becoming space debris, you know, and they have space debris re removal missions that are happening and you have, um, you know, the cost of reaching orbit is going down, you know, and we're, we're a big part of that with the way that uh, our space transportation systems are much more cost effective. Uh, and they have to be, you know, to be competitive in the market, there's, there's other companies that'll, that'll take you to orbit much cheaper than, than, than it was just uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. And that creates new business models because, you know, a, a sensor, you know, in the, you know, the spacecraft themselves are getting smaller and, and lighter and, and, and less expensive too. So you can build a spacecraft cheaper, you can get it to orbit cheaper. So if you have a mission concept 
that would have been way too cost prohibitive in the past, you know, today you can probably get that up and running and 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 do it within a budget that makes sense for your organization, whether it's a, a university or a government agency or or a commercial entity. You know, there's there's a lot of exciting things that, that can be done in space now. Yeah, definitely. I think we're definitely getting to a point now where, well, I think we're past the point where we're seeing things, the impossible, it's not a word anymore. We're seeing things that we never dreamed of made possible. And I really love kind of to hear that, you know, you're talking about the continued learning that you're experiencing. And I think that sounds like it's a theme of your career. You've had your fingers in so many pies over the years. And, you know, you're now at a point where you're loving what you're doing. You're working for this incredible, innovative company and you're seeing all this change and at the forefront of the change. I think that's amazing to see. So we've kind of, so speaking about where you are now, where you've kind of, how you got to here, um, my favorite question that we ask our guests is, so now that you're embedded into the industry and you've got all this incredible experience, what is it that you love most about space out of everything that you've experienced? What would you say is your, the thing that you love the most? I would have to say it's definitely the people, um, you know, because yeah. space, the space industry has some of the smartest people you know, anywhere. And, and they just have this, you know, mindset that they can change the world for the better. You know, this can do, Hey, that looks like it's hard. I'm going to go try to do that. And, and they do it, you know, and so sometimes you fail along the way, but when you fail, you learn from that failure, you know, and then you, you, you pick it up and you try again, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, the space industry is full of, you know, companies that, that, you know, didn't reach orbit the first time. So they, they did it on their second try. Like, you know, like we did with our alpha launch too, you know, you, you can't give up just because you, you reach that first, um, you know, barrier, you got to break through those barriers. And that's, that's something I see everywhere in the space industry is this can do attitude, this, this mindset that, uh, you know, that we're making the world a better place through what we do. Yeah, completely. I, I completely agree with you that I think anyone in the industry must, I can't see how anyone wouldn't agree with you. It's that the collaborative mindset and the kind of shared passion everyone in the industry shares. And I think that's kind of why this podcast is so important to kind of push that message out there and to get more people inspired because more people could be a part of this industry. It, it, more people could be a part of these incredible things they're hearing about. I think these kinds of conversations, you know, we're showing people how they can get into the industry, how the small, I think when people kind of look at the big, look at the, um, the end result, they think I could never get there. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, X, Y, and Z reasons why I can't. But I think the, the highlighting the steps and showing the progress and the journey really shows people that space, space is accessible. And that really is one of the big motives of us starting this podcast is to kind of demystify space and make it accessible for everyone. And something, a really hot topic on on that kind of point at the moment is the battle for talent to, to new talent to join the industry and kind of these diverse skills and these diverse backgrounds and what more we can be doing to to impact this personally at Avona we think that we need to be impacting change at a much younger age through kind of STEM and STEAM initiatives so that we can make sure that we're sustaining the the growth of the sector for years to come by nurturing this talent and, and kind of drawing these skills into the sector um for, so from your experience what do you personally feel that we could be doing differently across the industry and as well as i said at stem level with these kind of younger people to impact change now and for future generations well i, I agree i think it's uh, very important to to get the young people involved um, and I like to see the the way that kind of internships are changing, you know, where they get to work on something meaningful. You know, the I remember when I was growing up and people said internship, you know, it's like, oh, you get to be like the office assistant and fetch people coffee. Mm -hmm. You coffee, know, and that was yeah. kind of the that's what people thought, of, you know, of internships. And um, I think, you know, the other side of the pond, the Europeans kind of started to get this right a bit earlier. Um, you know, but I am seeing, you know, things kind of following suit, suit here in the US now too, you know, where you, you have like at the European Space Agency, we had a whole cadre of young graduate uh, trainees that would come in every year, and they would work on like a project, you know, for six months or for a year, depending upon the duration of their contracts, but they really have like 
something that was theirs that they take ownership of, you know, and, and the companies that were over there ha had similar things where they had these kind of rotational programs that would, they would bring in a new graduate and they would let them work in a technical part of the company for a little while. And they'd let them work in maybe marketing for a little while and get some exposure to management, you know, and, and over the course of a year or sometimes two years, these programs would, you know, get them exposed to different parts of the company and get them feeling comfortable working on, you know, some of these different uh, areas and figuring out really what they want to do. Because, because, you know, when you're that age, you, know, you go to college and they're like, hey, pick your degree program. And it's like, well, this is going to define who you are to some extent, you know, and, and a lot of times at that age, you don't know who you are yet. You're still kind of in the discovery process. So I think giving, you know, young, you know, young graduates or even young students who, you know, who come for the summer, maybe, or maybe they come and they work part time while they're going to school, give them something to really work on that has meaning that they can you know, build their skill set with, build their their understanding of, of what the company does. And a lot of times, you know, these these young graduates or these these student interns that come in, they're not going to end up working for, you know, your company in the future. They might not even work in this industry in the future, but having gotten that exposure, help them, you know, help them along the way and and to find out what it is that they do want to do. And I think that that's the important part, you know, is that uh, for each of us to be able to find our own place, you know, and, 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 to give those opportunities to, you know, to have an impact uh, even at a very young age and to feel like you're a part of it. You're not like just coming in and fetching somebody coffee, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I think you've really hit the nail on the head here that, um, that, that I, I love exactly. You've made such a good point there. The way the internships kind of the modern internship, it's the hands-on experience that is available to people. And it's not just getting coffee. As we've said, it's more, it's more than that now. It's, there's so much more out there and this incredible experience can really kickstart your career. And I think you also made a very important point. It was great to hear that people were kind of being moved throughout the companies, throughout different departments, because that is something else that we really try and promote is there's more than one path into the space industry and there's more than one department within the space industry. You know, if, if you, if someone came into this company and they got put in the, in the marketing department or the operations department, you know, that that is a way to work in these incredible companies. And I think giving people that kind of comprehensive experience within the company and letting them actually roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty and really join the team and kind of work with them and not feel like you're the um, PA or what be so incredible for these young people to have that experience. I think um, something which I think is very important that is a kind of a barrier to a lot of younger people is... Um, Obviously, social media huge. There's no getting away from it, no matter who you are. And it's, I think, the portrayal that people kind of promote on social media and the way people put themselves out there on the internet when they're kind of promoting themselves. We always see the successes and the achievements and the product of the years of hard work and success. But people aren't very often aren't very quick to kind of promote the work and the grind and the sacrifices that kind of led up to that. So something I think that I would love to hear from you that I think would be really valuable to some of our younger listeners um, who maybe, you know, are getting this kind of distorted view from from online, because that is where most of us, a lot of people just, that's a, the sole source that they get their information. So in the interest of transparency, failure is a very strong word, but in your experience, what would you say was your biggest failure to date, if you will call it that? what you learned from that and then on the other side of the fence what would you consider to be your biggest career achievement to date so i think uh you, you know the, i mean these are these are tough questions too you know this is uh you know some self reflection to kind of come up with you know some different ideas of where where you succeeded and where you failed i guess but uh i think when i think of a failure and especially one that i learned from um, I, I had a, an idea for a startup uh, several years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, not quite, maybe I think it was probably about 2014. So we had, uh, I was working at ESA at the time and they had this, this ESA business incubator, um, you know, and I went to a few meetings with this and I met some of the other people that uh, have actually been very successful starting up their companies um, that, that were in the same, you know, kind of place as I was at the time. They were engineers that had ideas. They wanted to start a company. And I had this, this grand idea to start a company and uh I went and pitched it to several uh, different people. I got some angel investors that were actually interested and wanted to give me a little bit of money. 
But uh, I actually turned their money down because I said, I don't want to take your money and then not be able to raise what I need to to really start the company, you know, going. But I learned a lot through the process uh, of doing that. And, and uh, from my time at, at business school, I had, you know, some some uh, friends and colleagues, you know, the cadre that I that I had studied with and so on. And I had kind of coached them through their businesses a little bit. And I felt like, hey, I can do this, too. Um, so then when I had my idea and I wrote up my business plan and I pitched it and and it was hard. You know, it wasn't it wasn't so easy. But along the way, I learned, um, you know, what I had done wrong. You know, I learned from, you know, why I wasn't able to start the business. But then, you know, going and working for for other companies, I was able to take some of these these things that I had learned through the process of trying to start my company and say, hey, this is how you can do it better. Uh, and this is how, you know, th with what, what we're doing here at this company, what, uh, what, what, what I can do and how I can play a part. And I learned a lot through, through that process. Um, but then uh, I guess on the other side, you, you asked about, you know, what is my, my greatest success? And this is, th this one is actually harder for me to think about. I don't know, maybe just because, you know, as I self-reflect, I try to figure out what, what I can do better in different situations a lot. And, and you know, just kind of patting myself on the back <laughs> isn't part of my my personality, I guess, too much. No. But uh, um, I, I guess it'd be hard to pick one, but maybe I'll talk about a few of the the, the incredible missions that I worked on when I was at ESA. Um, so when I started, they put me uh, working on Herschel and Planck, and these were, were space observatories. And uh, just a year earlier, I, I had been finishing up my, you know, my, my, my master in, you know, in space studies at uh, Emory-Riddle. Um, and I did a report for one of my classes on on Lagrange points and how great they would be for for different space missions. And then here I am at ESA, I'm working on Herschel and Planck, which are at Lagrange too. And I'm like, well, I, I just wrote a paper about this, and now I'm doing this, you know. And and uh, and and we took both of those missions through their end of life. And uh, so we we had continued operations for some years while I was there. And then we took first Herschel and then Planck through the end of life process. And both of them are now in uh, you know a, a solar centric orbit that's away from the Earth Moon system, so they won't. Uh, get in the way of other other missions like James Webb that want to go out to you know to L two although you know the Lasidu orbits they're in are pretty big anyway but 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 yeah they're they're completely away from our system where they won't um, you know have an impact on future missions and that was that was pretty cool to be part of that and then uh, following on from Herschel and Planck I got involved with Integral and this was the mission that I worked on the longest while I was at ESA I think I was on the Integral team for about uh, uh, six years of the eight that I was there and and uh, uh, so Integral is is uh, in a highly elliptical orbit. Um, it uh, when I, when I first started with the mission, the orbit was seventy two hours, three days. Uh, and again, thinking about you know the end of life of the mission, they they did an orbit lowering while I was working for the mission. It's now a sixty four hour orbit. So instead of nine days for three orbits, it now takes eight days for three orbits, and they're kind of phased wow. a third of the way around the Earth. It's pretty cool how they how they mm. design the orbit. But more importantly. Um, uh, if memory serves, I haven't looked this up recently, but uh, I think 2029 is the, the year that now that new orbit will decay to the point where it will come down um, somewhere in the far southern latitudes, you know, a, a, along a, a latitude line that won't have, you know, any, any um, you know, inhabited area. So it'll, it'll reenter Earth, it'll burn up. And, uh, you know, in case anything does reach, it'll splash down in the water. So they, they designed an orbit, you know, 15 years out. Uh, and did a maneuver that would then put the spacecraft in a position where it would properly be disposed of at the end of its life, which was pretty cool. And, um, and at Integral, one of the interesting things that I got involved was with uh, a mission of that, that age. They had uh, been around almost 20 years, now more than 20 years, but when I got started, it was a bit less. And uh, they had a problem with RF interference. And um, when I got, got started working with them, I said, hey, we can, we can do something about this. And uh, there was there was a lot of doubt in the room. Let's say when I I when I made that statement that we could do something about this, but we went through the the painstaking effort of figuring out different um, other spacecraft that were actually interfering with Integral, and then going through the process of the ITU to to uh, uh, talk to the people who were operating these other spacecraft and say, hey, you're you're interfering with us. Can we do something about this? And after you know many years of, of reaching out to different missions and identifying different ones. When I left, they didn't have much of an RFI problem at all anymore. And being that it, you know, had launched in, in you know, as early as it had and, and uh, the design of spacecraft at that time, they didn't have a lot of onboard data handling. So if they get an RF interference, they're just losing data. You know, they're, they're, they're up there and they're, they're recording incredible things in, in the infrared and, you know, gamma rays and, and doing really cool science. 
and you could have an RF interference in the middle of that science. And then all of a sudden you don't have the data that you need. Um, you know, and, and that's the whole reason why the spacecraft is out there. So that was, that was pretty cool to be an impact, uh, you know, on their mission that way. And then um, another uh, family of missions that I got involved with was the Earth Explorer missions. And I got a, uh, I worked on quite a lot of them, um, but most notably, I think, is the Sentinels. So I worked on the first seven of the Sentinel missions. You know, I did the the end to end ground segment validation, uh, proving out that everything was going to work. And each one was a little bit different. So there were some different challenges that we found along the way there. And I was involved in uh, what we call the launch and early orbit phase of the mission where, you know, the, the rocket takes off and everybody kind of sees that. You know, and 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 then and then you get the separation. Well, our our job as space spacecraft, you know, operations teams happens after separation. So you know, everybody, hey, hey the launch was great. You know, and then our our job starts, and we have to take this thing out into bring it into service. You know, so they deploy the different uh, systems that are on board, and they test them and make sure they work. Um, you know, you work through if there's any anomalies. So there's a lot of different uh, processes involved with doing this, and I got I got to do this uh, several times uh, at ESA uh, with the Sentinels and, and, and some other missions as well. And it was pretty cool to be a part of that. Yeah, it's uh, pretty cool as an understatement. That is some incredible experience that you've been at the forefront of. I think the level of kind of collaboration and problem solving that you've just explained there across all of those missions is just incredible. And I that must have been so ama amazing for you to be a part of. And I think even something really important, just to kind of go back to the earlier part of your question, even the way that you, you know, this startup idea that you were talking about, even that, it sounds like it was a huge learning curve that then, you know, kind of led you on to these incredible missions that you were a part of. And I think a really important takeaway is that, you know, you said that you you took what you learned from your experience and from that particular experience with the startup and your other experiences, and you took it on board, you kind of analyzed it in your head went over it and you you went on to do some incredible incredible things well thanks i feel like i played a small part on some incredible missions <laughs> yeah, it's a group it's a group effort though no you know it's Absolutely. every 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 single person that was involved you know is is responsible for the success of the mission so don't downplay your part in that i don't think um so i'm kind of on this on your incredible kind of space journey into the industry, something, a really valuable question that we ask our podcast guests is what were the best resources that you identified and utilized over those kinds of years, whether that's courses, programs, mentors, things that kind of helped you segue into the space industry and to also progress within it? So I, I go back like to the earlier question, and it's really all about the people. Um, the space industry is a very small community and the people you work with at one company, you're going to cross paths with them. They'll be your collaborators, your customers, they'll, they'll be your competitors in some cases, and that'll come full circle throughout your career. I think at least that's been my experience. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's all about building good relationships, you know, and, and, uh, and then that, you know, over time that, that grows into a, a pretty big network that you can turn to people and say, Hey, I'm having this problem. Can you help me with it? Or, Hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this or help me with that? You know, and it's, it's, uh, um, you know, so it, it's a great community to be a part of. And to me, that's, you know, that's the differentiator is, is, is the people. And, and you can't, uh, you know, like a, you hear it in, in, I think any walk of life, you know, that, you know, don't burn your bridges when you, you leave someplace, but in the space industry, I think as small as uh, the space industry is, that's even more true, you know, because if you, you know, cause some disruption when you're leaving, uh, you know, one, one company or one job or one mission that you're working on or whatever the case may be, you're going to see those people again, you know? So, so, um, you know, just treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, the, the golden rule, I guess, and, and be part of, uh, these great things that are going on. Yeah, definitely. I think what you just said, that is so true. Even I've been working in the industry for maybe eight, nine months, eight months now, maybe nine. And, you know, when I started, I was speaking to people on the podcast, we were connecting on LinkedIn. And I'm always, you know, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, connecting with them. And something I very quickly started to notice was that everyone knows each other already. I was connecting, thinking, oh, they are already connected with all these people that I've spoken with. And I think as I continue talking to people, the kind of level of, as you said, it's a relatively small community, but the kind of 
the connections within it. And as you said, I can imagine you would be constantly crossing paths with people that you've met. And like you said, as long as you've not burnt these bridges, those relationships must just be kind of, it must be incredible to see them build kind of throughout your careers. And I think something else really common, like you said, that the importance of the people and how incredible the people are in the sector is the how everyone wants to build people up you know, boost them up and help them with whatever they're looking for. If that's kind of career development, professional, personal development, you know, if they're kind of maybe further along in their career, you know, I think people love what they do in this industry and they're really keen to share that passion and knowledge to help, you know, people that maybe are a few steps behind them on their journey to reach the heights that they've kind of got their eyes set on. Absolutely. I, I think one more thing that I'd like to say is is uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes or to admit that you made a mistake, um, you know, mm-hmm. or to you or to admit that you don't know something. You know, if somebody asks a question and you're not sure, you know, have the courage to say, "Hey, I, I don't I don't really know the answer to that question. Let's figure it out together, or maybe we can find the answer over here." Um, you know, I've I've had a lot more uh, good experiences, let's say, over the years with people who had that kind of an attitude, and then there's other people that I've met that you know, they, they gave into the fear. So they would try to pretend like they knew the answer to the question or they'd half answer the question and try to, you know, try to, try to um, convince you that, 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 that they're an expert in, in everything. And, you know, we're not all experts in everything. We're all on this journey together. Um, so just, you know, have the, have the, be, be humble and, and don't be afraid to say, Hey, I, I don't really know that. And, and let's, you know, let's go look that up or I, you know, come back to me a little bit. I'm, I'm busy right now. Um, but hey, I can help you to try to, to figure that out later, you know, whatever the case may be. But don't try to pretend like you know something that you don't because there's so, so many things out there and we're not an expert in everything, you know? Yeah, definitely. That we, um, we've had, we've spoken to someone on the podcast before. I can't quite remember who it was, but we asked what the worst advice they'd ever been given was. And they said, fake it till you make it. Which to me, I usually quite like that phrase, but they said, when you're in the space industry, to a certain extent, yeah, fake it till you make it in terms of confidence, maybe, but you can't, don't pretend you know things that you don't know, because it's, you know, I think that that's kind of the point you've just made is it can only go so far faking it if you, you know, when you're in this kind of industry. And I think that is a very important kind of nugget of wisdom is being humble and allowing yourself to be vulnerable is so valuable. I think it's a really valuable trait that you so I think a lot of people do have to learn it, but it's the only way that you can truly learn and grow and and grow and learn in the in the areas that that you genuinely need to as an individual, you know, which is highlighted by the things that you don't know or you're maybe unsure of. So yeah, I think completely, yeah, kind of vulnerability and being humble is, yeah, as you said, very, very important. So um still on the topic of you know, how we can kind of help younger people and people who are at the kind of early stages of their career um, segue in. What what advice would you give to someone from either a technical or very importantly, I think something to talk about is maybe a non-technical background who are looking to kind of pursue a career in the space industry? I would just say, don't be intimidated. You know, there's, mm-hmm. there's opportunities in the industry. You know, we need all people of all backgrounds. You know, so, you know, any company that's in the industry needs, you know, people that are doing, you know, finance or, or accounting or marketing or, you know, artwork, um, you know, d- design, you know, in addition to the, you know, the very technical fields with engineer and science and, and things like this, um, you know, but then there's also companies that are non-technical that are part of the industry. And I'll, I'll give a, a shout out to, uh, you know, to, to Daniel and my colleagues at uh, the Astro Agency. Uh, in the UK. So I, I, I sit on their advisory board. So I, I feel obliged to, to mention them a little bit. And uh, but here you have a company that's that's bringing the message of space uh, and, and, and cool space thing, companies and, and organizations, because they're also, um, you know, promoting some of the, the UK space sector, you know, government programs and things too. And, uh, you know, it, it's a marketing agency. You know, so so most of the people there don't don't have you know the same technical background. Let's say that uh, the the people at Firefly that I work with do, and and that's okay. They're still part of the same industry, and you know, so find your niche, find find where you know you have a passion to do something cool in the industry, and just just go do it. 
you know, don't be intimidated. Don't, don't get in your own way. Don't, don't convince yourself that you're not qualified for this position that you think would be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, fun and have some growth and where you could contribute. Just, just go do it. Yeah, definitely. I think when I um, signed up to do my English literature degree, I don't think I ever thought that it would, you know, take me into the space industry, but here I am. And I think, like you said, it's, it's a really, really important message that is, I think it's Yvonne is kind of one of our really core messages is that, you know, there's space, space is for everyone and there is space for everyone in the industry. And it's people of all backgrounds, people of all skills and experiences. And it's these unique and diverse skills and, and backgrounds. And as I said, experiences that are vital to the growth of the industry, because it's not all just rocket scientists, engineers and astronauts. That is a very, obviously it's a huge part of the industry, but when you look at the bigger picture, it's not the it's not the only element. And you know, you need the, as you said, the finance department and an operations department and the marketing department to it's a joint, it's a joint effort because it, it you know, it's not just about the the product, it's about how everyone kind of comes together and does their own bit, brings what they are really good at to the table, brings their own passions and talents to the table. And it doesn't, you don't have to have, you don't have to be an engineer. That's not, that's something that I think is a quite a common misconception as you know, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'd love to work in space, but I'm, I'm bad at maths or oh, I'd love to work in the space industry, but I'm bad at science. But, you know, I think it's um something that I love kind of seeing people's reactions to people who haven't had that thought process, seeing the kind of spark go off in their head that I have these skills and experiences and these talents that I can bring to the industry that can ultimately contribute to the success of it. Absolutely. Yep, definitely. Um, so Sam, to kind of round off, really love speaking with you. I've loved hearing about your experiences and everything that you've been a part of and kind of your take on everything. You've got really, I really love your kind of view on the industry. So I would love to know, um, as my final question, what are your thoughts on the current status of the aerospace sector and how do you see this evolving over the next, say, five to 10 years? Well, first of all, that's a fantastic question, too. And um, <laughs> if I could if I could really accurately answer that question, I would know where to invest money so that I could have a fantastic <laughs> retirement. Um, but, you know, so I, I think what I'll what I'll speak to is the things that are I see going on that are developing right now that I, I'm most excited about. Um, and and for, you know, I, Maybe, maybe I'll try to come up with three of them. Let's say, uh, so, so lunar exploration, I think is one of my passions. And uh, that's what drove me to, you know, here to work here at Firefly, where I get to be involved with this Blue Ghost mission, really exciting stuff. And, and uh, you know, and, and beyond lunar exploration, the, the talk of kind of deep space exploration, eventually going to Mars, you know, and the, and the scientific missions that go even further out into the, the solar system than that. Um, I, I think that, this is a very exciting thing, and I think the technologies we're seeing are, are you know, really making uh, a difference. Um, the next area I would say is making space uh, more accessible. Um, you know, and in, in, in this, this, this is launch, you know, this is uh, space transportation. It's what we're doing at Firefly and, and, and other companies as well. Um, but, but then also, you know, the cleaning up space, I think. Um, so the, the whole space debris problem has has come to the forefront because these big constellations are going up you know when we were putting up one or two satellites you know at a time and, and, and launches didn't happen very often space was big and it didn't seem like a big problem you know and then you had the 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 uh the collision with the cosmos satellite uh what was it about 2009 i think um mm -hmm. you probably look it up and find out that i got my date wrong but uh, if memory serves it was a you know a little over a decade ago we had a a, a full on collision of two satellites and 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 there's a lot of studies that went into how that debris spread out so seeing the 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 early developments that we have in debris removal and and seeing the you know the the emphasis on making sure that you have your kind of end of life for your mission planned out um to me is a big shift in the industry and i like to see where it's going and i'd like to see how that unwinds in the coming years so i think that was i think that was three different things that uh that are that are developing the industry there's there's so many things going on that i could probably continue to list 10 things going on in the industry but i think that's that's pretty a pretty good subset um to speak about the the excitement um and new things new challenges going on yeah i would say to be honest i if i had to choose three i think that i think you've just chosen my three i think as you said kind of the lunar exploration and especially the phrase deep space exploration just 
oh, gives me tingles. It's just the most exciting thing. And, you know, the other day when we saw the ancient universe, universe breaker galaxies, I think they were called, kind of seeing things like that. And when we, um, was it the James Webb telescope found the um, supermassive black hole that was singing? Did you hear about that? I, I didn't read about that one, no, but it, it does sound it was, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I wrote an article on it, so I'll send it to you after this. Um, it's just it's just incredible, and the things that are out there, and I think that, yeah, completely, that is, I think, undeniably one of the most exciting things. And I think a very good closing point from you is the cleaning up space and the sustainability of space, because that is something that I was surprised to learn when I joined the industry. As you said, it's causing these collisions. It's so congested in there, and I think as we're, Kind of launch activity and there's so much going on in space and there's so many so much so many satellites kind of in orbit i think you know companies like firefly who are putting this emphasis and promoting the importance of kind of sustainable space exploration and getting people thinking about that i think is really really important and i think a perfect closing comment for the podcast interview well thank you again it's been a pleasure so thank you for inviting me to be participating in your podcast and and to share you know, my thoughts on the industry, my perspective, um, and hopefully it, uh, you know, helps some of your audience to to find their way into the industry, as you say, with the origin stories. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. We hope so, too. It's been our absolute pleasure to have you. Really appreciate you joining so early in the morning. You've got your whole day ahead of you. <laughs> Indeed. But it is yeah. Friday, right? So. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Thank you for reminding me. Lovely. Well, Sam, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining me and hope to speak soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Excellent. I'll talk to you again soon. Yes, definitely. Bye.